So we, um, my name is Paul Gross, for those who don't know me. Uh, I see a lot of people who do know me, so it's nice to see you all. Um, um, I run the English events here, and we, um, we have a number of uh, regular events, both here in the center and also on Zoom. And we've been doing that for several, for several years now. Um, and usually, I would say, the topics that we're discussing, which are around Israeli politics or history or culture, the English-speaking audience, which is to say both people who've made Aliyah and also the people watching on Zoom from outside Israel, are at something of a disadvantage, usually, um, compared to their native-born Israeli friends, uh, because the native-born Israeli friends grew up here and imbibed the culture and lived through a lot of the events that we, that we talk about in a way that some of us didn't. Um, and, um, and so one of the reasons we present these topics in English is to uh, help inform um, uh, the, the Anglo crowd in Israel and also, of course, um, the, the community outside of Israel. On this topic, the, dis the, the topic of discussion this evening, um, it's a little bit different because actually I think on this issue of foreign media, um, med the way the media covers Israel, the, the way the media reports on Israel, um, it's the people in this room and the people watching back home uh, on Zoom that have been um, aware, painfully aware, uh, of this issue for many years. Um, I can say on a personal note that um, my own entry into the world of Israel, uh, Israel advocacy or um, defending Israel or really thinking about Israel was, as a very young man, um, fresh out of university, um, working, in, working for the Jewish community in Britain uh, at when the Second Intifada kicked off. And that was, as many of you will know, a, a time when there was an absolute torrent of um, misinformation and, although it wasn't called that at the time, fake news about, uh, about Israel and what Israel was doing to, to quell the tide of, of uh, Palestinian terrorism. Um, and so now with this uh, war that we're in, uh, some 166 days old, I think that's right, um, I think it's high time that we discuss this issue uh, in the context of this war with some real experts. Um, and, okay, someone didn't listen to me. Whoever that is, turn it off. From now on, no mercy, okay? Phone's on. If I hear a phone, you're out of the room. I'm serious. Um, my kids will tell you I can be quite tough. Um, all right, so we, we have a couple of real experts with us this evening. Uh, first up, I want to introduce uh, Gil Hoffman, the executive, the executive editor and executive director of Honest Reporting, which fights for Israel in the international mainstream and social media. He's also a lecturer on political strategy at Israel's College of Management. He was previously for 24 years chief political correspondent and analyst for the Jerusalem Post, where he's now a regular columnist. He was named by the Algemeiner website recently as one of the top 100 people positively influencing Jewish life, which is very nice. Um, he was raised in Chicago, uh, graduated magna cum laude from Northwestern University School of Journalism, and served in the IDF spokespersons unit. Go off. Works. Okay. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, thank you to uh, all of you in the crowd for coming out here tonight and proving how much you care uh, about the fight that's going on. And uh, it, it is a pleasure to be the understudy uh, of Elon here tonight, uh, to be the, the, the garnish uh, on the main course that you're getting here. But uh, uh, I know that uh, we all appreciate what he has done day in and day out in this fight. So if any decisions are being made about you, uh, I hope they see the applause right here uh, tonight. Um,
Uh, so tonight's topic is, is fighting the media war, and, and it's really not easy to fight that media war. Um, we're making... Okay, just like technological things are not easy. Uh, Israel had a lot of uh, empathy in the war on the media battlefield on uh, October 7th and maybe 8th. Uh, already on October 9th, not so much. This was on October 9th on CNN. And That's I'm going to press that areas. button. Palestinians live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, uh, now, now being it. pummeled by Israeli airstrikes. Nine million Palestinians live in Is this Gaza, how loud one it gets? of the most densely populated areas on Earth, now being pummeled by Israeli airstrikes. Nine million Palestinians live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, are being pummeled by Israeli airstrikes. Nine million Palestinians live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated okay. areas on Earth. So if you can hear, pummeled by Israeli uh, airstrikes. Mr. Vaus, the anchor of CNN, Gaza, is saying nine million Palestinians live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. And it's amazing how in a seven-second video, how many lies you can fit in. live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, now being pummeled by Israeli airstrikes. Nine million Palestinians live in Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas on Earth, now being pummeled by Israeli airstrikes. You heard it. Did you count the number of lies? How many Palestinians live in Gaza? Two million, okay. Is it one of the most densely populated areas on Earth? No. Uh, so this is what we're up against. But so we thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. You're exactly right and he's exactly wrong. But we, even though it is difficult to fight against this, we Jews don't fear uphill battles. We fight them and we win them. And uh, we have to win. We have to win because winning on the media battlefield is the key to winning on the military battlefield. And that has been proven throughout the history of the state of Israel. And it's being proven right now. When, as Paul said, we are in day 166 of a war. If you look at the last few years, wars in Gaza were allowed to last about three days before the international pressure persuaded the Israeli leadership to stop. How has it gone from three days to be able to last 166 well, obviously, the magnitude of the atrocities of October 7th did that. Obviously, the world leaders understand that terror has to be defeated or it'll be emboldened in their countries. And God forbid there'd be more September 11th, 7-7s, and Bataclans. Obviously, the large contrast that there is between the way Israelis were when they were so divided before October 7th and the Yachad Nenatzeach, the way we are so united sort of still, uh, since October 7th, has made an impression on the world. But, but I dare to say that one of the main reasons why the world has allowed Israel to go on for so long in this war is because there have been successes on that media battlefield. Now, if you look at the IDF, the IDF has had so many mistakes in the past. You know all of them. Uh, just a classic example is the May 21 Gaza war when they destroyed a tower in Gaza that was known as the Associated Press Tower and the Al Jazeera Tower. And they gave an hour for everybody to leave as no army ever did in the history of mankind, but that also gave an hour for it to be filmed from every possible angle. And Israel looked terrible. It took a long time, too long for Israel to reveal that this was the cyber tower of Hamas and bringing it down saved lives because it was jamming Iron Dome. By then, the war was over and nobody was paying attention. Fast forward to this war, when the world believed that Israel purposely bombed a hospital in Gaza and killed exactly 500 people, mostly women and children, taking uh, the uh, information from Hamas as if it's gospel from Jesus, 
the IDF chief of staff, Daniel Hagari, made sure uh, that the, the IDF spokesman, Daniel Hagari, made sure that the chief of staff, Herzi Alevi, and the commander of the Air Force stayed up all night until they had the truth out there to the media around the world. It took four hours. I wish it could take four seconds, but it used to take four weeks. And the army has come a long way. The spokespeople for the government have done a great job led by Elon. And now me and Elon are gonna cheer for the crowd, okay? Because, wait, how many of you have posted or shared something on social media since October 7th? So we're, 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 we're clapping for you uh, because uh, we appreciate what you, each and every one of you have done and it really does make a difference. But uh, since I only have 10 minutes to speak, now, now I'm gonna say that my organization, Honest Reporting, uh, has done its part too. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've come a long way. Uh, just in 2022, 4 million people saw our stuff on social media. In 2023, we upped it from 4 million to 123 million. of which 45% are under 25, 89% are under 45. And that means that we're getting out of our echo chamber, getting to the young people, and that's very, very important. We've been a lot more aggressive since I took over Honest Reporting in July of 2022, alongside our amazing CEO, Jackie Alexander. We have gotten 10 anti-Semitic Hitler and Hamas praising journalists suspended, reassigned, or fired, including, including two from CNN, two from the Associated Press, and three from the New York Times. In August of 2022, we had a war in Gaza. And so I asked my team who covered this war. There's no freedom of the press there. And they found uh, that the guy who covered the war for the New York Times had written on his social media, Jews are sons of dogs, and I'm in favor of killing them, including the elderly and the young, like Hitler. Now, he was fired, and I met with the bureau chief, Patrick Kingsley, who, who said, you guys at Honest Reporting did a better job vetting that guy than I did, you think? Uh, um, and I said, not just him. A couple more well, I found uh, that my team found this morning, including a guy who praised Hitler uh, named Suleiman Hiji, who was fired in August of 2022 and rehired on October 8th of 2023. And when the New York Times said, hey, he violated our policies back then, he won't violate them now. Uh, but thankfully, because of the outcry there was, we haven't seen his byline since. Same thing with the guy at AP who uh, wrote in English on social media that Jews are Nazis and have to be eliminated. And uh, that brings us to the photographers. On November 8th, Honest Reporting asked, who are the photographers that took these pictures so early in the morning that day? How did they get there? Why did they know to be there? We just asked questions. And we came under fire from the media outlets who got very defensive. Um, and uh, they asked us, did we have answers? And we didn't claim to have answers then. Now we do. Since then, we've seen uh, a, uh, Hassan Asliach, who was working for CNN and AP, getting a kiss from Yechia Sinwar. We saw Faik Abu Mustafa from Reuters and AP bragging about how he was there in Sterot from the beginning as the men were taken out, they did whatever they wanted with the women and they killed the dogs. We've seen the Al Jazeera journalists, journalists, right? Who were working for Hamas. And then just now, Ilana Dayan, the top journalist in Israel, revealed the Hamas plans for infiltrating Israel. That included a line saying, we will get the journalists to work for us. And that is the smoking gun uh, that uh, incriminates many of the journalists that uh, either knew or in, unwittingly, maybe at best, uh, helped the plan of Hamas that day. Uh, dare I show one more video before I'm done?
the internet by asking how Gazan photojournalists were able to get to the scene of Hamas's crimes so quickly on the morning of October 7th, almost like they had advanced knowledge of the attack. What if I told you that it was all part of the plan? Israel's flagship investigative journalism show, Uvda, got hold of an Israeli intelligence report showing how Hamas intended to use Palestinian journalists. Why? To control and manipulate the narrative. To make the case that raping and murdering innocent Israelis is a legitimate tool of resistance. This is just the latest evidence to emerge that validates Honest Reporting's expose on November 8th. There is no freedom of the press in Gaza. Hamas controls the flow of information. Keep that in mind whenever you hear news coming out of Gaza. Remember when Honest reported? Okay, so that's Sarah. She does TikTok videos for us, and it's incredibly important because nowadays, more than half of American young people, they don't Google, they don't have encyclopedias. Their search engine is TikTok. And if you Google what is Zionism on TikTok, you're not going to get something from the Begin Center. You're going to get something with a hashtag Allahu Akbar or a hashtag Free Palestine. So we have to be fighting that fight on TikTok. So uh, that's what Honest Reporting is doing. And uh, any support that you could give, uh, subscribe to our, uh, get our emails, get honestreporting.com slash subscribe. Follow us on social media. If I'm allowed to say, go to honestreporting.com slash donate. We need all the help that we could get. And uh, if you know anyone who could use a speaker in America, please email Gil at honestreporting.com. Thank you so much, Paul and the Begin Center for this wonderful opportunity. Okay, well, we'll be hearing more from Gil in a short while. Uh, before we get to conversation that I'll have with both of our speakers and then questions from you, um, we have next a speaker who I think needs no introduction. Um, and who I suspect will get an even larger applause tonight than perhaps on other nights. Um, Enel Levy, uh, who was, who was uh, appointed as an Israeli government spokesman uh, as after the commencement of the war. Uh, he's, uh, you've all seen him on, on TV. You've all seen him on viral videos. You've seen his eyebrows, I suspect. Um, he's, the, uh, he's the host of the State of a Nation podcast. Uh, he previously served as the international media advisor to the president of Israel after a career as a TV news anchor. He was born and raised in the UK. He studied at the universities of Oxford and Cambridge before making Aliyah and serving in the IDF. And on Levy. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, During this war, no few journalists have given me grief, but Gil, I've always liked you. So, so it's a pleasure to be introduced by you today. Um, after around 500 media appearances over the last five months, I want to share with you some personal thoughts and reflections in a personal capacity about what it has been like since October 7th fighting at the good fight for Israel in the international media, trying not only to win us time to finish the job of destroying Hamas and bringing back the hostages, but also to make sure that this war ends with our friendships and alliances intact and our friends and allies understanding that we are doing exactly what they would do, or rather what they would like to think that they would be capable of doing if such atrocities were perpetrated against them. Um, and the first thing I'll say is that, that I'm always slightly embarrassed when people point to me as, as somehow being the face of Israeli Hasbara because it's a team effort. And this is absolutely not a burden that I have been carrying on my shoulders alone over the last few months. And it goes all the way from the top. Prime Minister Netanyahu who has rolled up his sleeves and been fighting in the trenches, giving regular TV interviews. And every time the Prime Minister gives one of his fantastic interviews, I take out a pen and paper and immediately jot down all the information and all the sound bites because he still has a phenomenal ability to express things succinctly and clearly. 
The president, our wonderful president, Isaac Herzog, my former boss, I was his international media advisor, has also been taking the fight to the international media and doing Piers Morgan and CNN and all the major uh, appearances as well. I'm part of a team that includes the incredible ambassador, Mark Regev, who is Mori Verabi, really my mentor and guide and has taught me so much of what I know uh, and has been really an inspiration and a mentor. Tal Heinrich, who is an absolute tiger, who got on a plane on October 7th, has been doing interviews mostly from the studios in the United States and as well here in Israel, giving the press conferences, an absolute tiger. Avi Hyman, who started off mostly doing our press bookings and has now been taking on a huge number of interviews as well and fighting that corner. And of course, the professional apparatus of the National Public Diplomacy Directorate, led by Moshe Kaviv, who had the unenviable task at the beginning of this war of trying to mount an effective response and has done really a terrific job in bringing together the army and the police and the foreign ministry and all the different agencies to sit around one table, make sure that everyone is singing from the same hymn sheet. What do we say in the Jewish tradition? Not singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, making sure that we're all coordinated and that coordinated effort has meant that Israel is putting up a much better fight as a country than it has in any previous war. And that's even before I get on to speaking about all the IDF spokespeople who've done a terrific job. Peter Lerner and Jonathan Conricus, who together, they really, they deserve a round of applause. Managed at the peak of this war to do more interviews in a day than I was managing in a week, and I was exhausted. Daniel Hagari, who's been giving regular briefings as well. And of course, all the amazing soldiers uh, the IDF spokespersons unit. So really, everyone in this country, from the president and the prime minister to the 19-year-old girls in Dovertsal, have been putting on a phenomenal fight in making sure that we can still retain international support and solidarity. And it really is not to be taken for granted, as you mentioned earlier, that we still have international support 166 days on. It's no secret, there is pressure, there are disagreements, but our allies understand that this war has to end with the hostages home and Hamas out of power, and none of them are saying, you know what, it's time to call it quits, abandon the hostages and leave Hamas there. They are still signed on to the goals that the government under Prime Minister Netanyahu determined after Hamas declared war on October 7th, and that is absolutely not something we can take for granted. The sheer barbarity of the atrocities did a lot of it, but the work of everyone I've been speaking about has helped to sustain that support. Now, it's not easy because the information battlefield is not even. When I go on TV or any of the other spokespeople as spokespeople for the Israeli government or the National Public Diplomacy Directorate in the Prime Minister's office, I'm going against the UN Special Envoy for special humanitarian, nice, fluffy, duffy, nice things. And these are agencies and organizations that have simply been hijacked by the Palestinian agenda. The World Health Organization cannot bring itself to condemn Hamas's militarization of hospitals. The Red Cross cannot bring itself to condemn Hamas hijacking aid trucks. UNRWA actively covers up Hamas's theft of aid. There was a remarkable incident at the beginning of the war when UNRWA tweeted that officials purporting to be from the Gazan Ministry of Health stole fuel and medical supplies from one of their warehouses and their staff had to flee. Luckily, someone took a screenshot because they deleted it minutes later and then put out a correction that sounded like someone had put a gun to their social media intern's head saying, we deny reports on social media. What reports on social media? These were your own tweets. And then I had to go on the BBC after an UNRWA spokesperson, and they say, well, UNRWA assures us that Hamas cannot steal their aid. I said, what are you talking about? They admitted it. They deleted it. And now they're covering it up. They are in on it. They are in on it. And so when the World Health Organization comes out with a statement about Israel attacking medical facilities, or UNRWA makes a statement about famine or genocide or whatever they've been saying since October 7th, okay? The electricity that keeps running out and never does, the Hanukkah miracle. Um, it's not an even battlefield. It is not an even battlefield. It's David against Goliath. What makes it worse 
apart from having to deal with experts who have UN on their business card, and therefore Hamas is using them to launder information, using them to launder information for global consumption, is that the platforms through which we are trying to spread the information are weighted against us because they like things that are already popular in order to make them viral. So if you've got 15 million Jews in the world, not all of whom are on our side, against 2 billion Muslims who are broadly very consistent with their message sheet, um, it's not an easy fight. It's not an easy fight because, you know, I've seen Israeli influencers saying, I can go to Kfar Aza and film myself and talk about the atrocities, and Twitter's, TikTok's algorithm will actively suppress it, while someone in middle of nowhere's Ville, Canada can make a video saying Israel's committing genocide, and it will get millions and millions of uh, views. So the information battlefield is not easy, and it's a huge challenge, and that's why it requires such tenacity and such a concerted team effort. Now, what I've been trying to do since October 7th is to say there are no rules. I'm going to try to reinvent what it means to be a government spokesman in Israel, but also internationally. And pursued basically three strategies together with a team of incredible volunteers. This would not have been possible without a team of volunteers working for me. To say, we want to get information to people in the format that they most enjoy consuming content. It's not enough just to put out a press release and hope that the world does something with it. You be the world. You go do something with it. So we've had three prongs instead of just waiting for CNN to pick up to call me uh, and invite me on an interview. The first is press conferences. Never happened before that Israeli government spokespeople are giving a daily press conference in which journalists can ask questions. It was a decision made at the beginning of the war, backed by Moshe Kaviv, the head of the Maracha Asbara. There would be a podium, it would say on it, Prime Minister's office, and the spokesman would get up, give a recap of the day's stories, how we want to frame it, and journalists can ask questions over Zoom. There was a period when we had a physical press room uh, as well. Absolutely critical in being able to set the agenda, not having to respond to questions. I then get off a, uh, 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 an interview, um, I get off a press conference and immediately see where I'm getting quoted in all the live updates of the media channels because they're watching. There was a point at the peak of the... Hi, Greer. <laughs> there was a point at the peak of the last hostage release pause in November, and please, please, God, may we have another one soon now. Um, in which the BBC, Sky News, Fox News would interrupt their broadcasts to dip into, we are now going to the Israeli government is holding a press conference. And they would take for 10 minutes, me or the other government spokespeople standing in front of a podium and explaining the situation. And that was a surreal out-of-body experience to get off and suddenly see that the BBC and Sky News had dipped into that life. That's the first strategy. Press conferences, you can put out a statement, it's good for the media, but they need to see it on video. So you put it in video and you give them suddenly a soundbite they can use in their, um, in their reports. The second prong is social media. Um, journalists like to get their material on Twitter. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is simply to scroll through someone's Twitter account and see what they've been saying and then quote them. Okay. In the last week, I was able to get quotes in the New York Times, Washington, Wall Street Journal, and The Guardian about the food situation in Gaza because they simply quoted things that I was tweeting. Another strategy is to try to be a content creator. People enjoy watching, doing this on their phones to get materials. So take the information and do that. And I've got a great social media assistant who says, listen, this is great uh, trend now on TikTok. We should do this, we should do that. And trying to be as creative as possible in making, you know, like make, showing a hummus recipe, or um, I had one where I sat in uh, Dizengoff Square with one of the chaps on my team. He wrote a cover of Hey There Delilah called Hey There Hania about Hamas leaders living in luxury uh, abroad. Maybe I'll sing it for you later. And so trying to provide information in that form of entertainment because that's how people enjoy getting their information. So you get to make a message about Hamas corruption. And the third is uh, the podcast that I've launched. Uh, State of a Nation, which is a podcast, but really more of a talk show because we've built a whole studio. It is being backed by the diaspora ministry. 
uh, Minister Amichai Shikli has very generously put money behind it as against matching funding because we said people enjoy getting their information through podcasts. So come and be a fly on the wall as the spokesman has an in-depth conversation with policymakers, journalists, other spokespeople, and gets briefed about what is happening. And we're really breaking the rules. Two weeks ago, I was in New York and filmed an episode of the podcast with Congressman Richie Torres in his office in the Bronx. And I'm pretty happy to put money on it once we manage to raise the money to keep the podcast afloat, that, um, that it's probably the first time that a foreign government spokesman has ever interviewed a sitting politician from another country uh, for, a, for, for, for their own semi-official media platform. Um, and uh, so that's what we've been trying to do over the last 166 days. I don't think any of us thought it was going to go on so long. There's a long and um, dangerous road ahead with Rafah, the prime minister today, saying, of course, we will eventually move into Rafah. We have no choice. We're not going to leave the remainder of Hamas's battalions standing, keeping up that military pressure to get back the hostages. 134, we know 35 are dead. We have to continue fighting as if the other 99 are alive. Um, and of course, the very scary situation in the north, um, which, which can explode at any moment, um, because we have tens of thousands of people who have been refugees in their own country for nearly six months, and we need to get them back home. That's our first duty uh, as a state. Um, so that's a brief recap of everything we've been trying to do at the uh, National Public Diplomacy Directorate and the Prime Minister's office and personal reflections. Um, let's move on to the discussion. Any questions you have? Thank you. Does this work? Yes, good. Okay, um, so firstly, um, that was fantastic to hear both of you and um, uh, to hear, I, I know what a wonderful job Honest Reporting does and we can talk more about that as well. And you absolutely should subscribe if you're not already subscribed to Honest Reporting. Um, and Elon, that was an amazing... Um, oh, and subscribe to Elon's podcast, State of the Nation. Um, and then on that was an amazing behind the scenes look at what you've been doing. We've, we've all seen you in front of the camera and now we know a little about what's been going on behind the scenes. Okay, I'm gonna get to questions from you guys, don't worry. Um, I have a few of my own um, first. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for both of you. Um, and it's a question which I think many of us ask ourselves when we watch or read international media reporting on Israel and it's been, those of us who've been doing so for many years have been asking for many years and it's really this it's what where do you put the where do you put the balance of um the source of the animosity and the hostility and the double standards and all these things is it for some people i know people that would just say it's anti-semitism okay that's there's a i think some people would just say it's all anti-semitism and i personally think a lot of it is not all of it but a lot of it is but i'm interested to know where you think anti-semitism fits into it but also where is it just ignorance where is it just i don't know the sort of human inclination to side with the underdog and the the i think misapprehension that israel is that israel is the sort of oppressive uh, uh, force in this in this um, conflict um so i'm interested in what what is your experience each of you what has your experience told you about what is the source of the double standards and the animosity and the and the sort of seeming inability to apply fair journalistic standards to reporting on Israel. Who wants to go first? Yo. Can everyone hear me? Okay, so the anyone who thought that there was not rampant anti-Semitism around the world, uh, including the leader of a major American Jewish organization who said at, at a very large event that uh, in the fight against anti-Semitism, the cup was half full, was proven wrong on October 7th and since then. And uh, this is a very serious problem, and it hasn't been dealt with. And now we see that it must be dealt with, and it's not being dealt with properly. 
That's number one. Number two, absolutely there is inclination to support the underdog. I'm a Cubs fan, I get it. Uh, but there are uh, plenty of people who misunderstand who the underdog is. Uh, in a, a, with the most uh, discriminated against minority in the world, it's the small country surrounded by enemies and we have to constantly be getting that message out. And ignorance that you pointed out including among top journalists. We've seen it happen time and time again. Um, the uh, journalists parachuted into Israel from Ukraine, from America, without having any background to understand what's going on here. Uh, with a very short period of time to get news out uh, without being able to, to understand the depth of the conflict. It's the wrong model for getting the news out there. And in Gaza, it's even worse. Because there, uh, the government made a controversial decision, I understand both sides of it, to not let journalists in unaccompanied by Israel. So there have been some that have been embedded, and that's important, uh, but uh, because they aren't allowed in, uh, the majority of the news from Gaza is coming from ordinary Gazans with cell phones and freelancers who uh, were hired with very low standards. <sighs> Look, as a government spokesman, I have to be very careful about the information that I get and make sure that I'm using specific sources. And that's why I'm especially attuned to what the sources of information are and where they're coming from. So here's a story, for example, about how information gets laundered. Headline in The Guardian, month ago, UN officials warn Israel is not complying with the ICJ order. Interesting, who are these UN officials? Well, none other than Francesca Albanese, who, uh, get your groggers out, <laughs> um, who, who famously tweeted that, um, went out of her way to deny that October 7th was an anti-Semitic massacre, who on International Women's Day released this revoltingly condescending tweet to Israeli women saying, my dears, I hope you realize what you have become. Their consciences are clear. They know that they know exactly what they are fighting for. Um, who couldn't bring herself to shed even crocodile tears after the original atrocities, do anything for the hostages. And in fact, as Hillel Neuer and the great team at UN Watch have shown, uh, was known to be a deeply, deeply problematic character even before the UN appointed her. And, and her appointment was not despite that, it was because of it. So she gets to go in a headline as UN official says. And then there's the ICJ, which relied in its uh, original decision on statements made by UNRWA, which is a Hamas front. It is the principal organ that Hamas uses in order to launder its information. The same organization that employs terrorists on a massive scale, that allows terrorists to dig tunnels under its schools with shafts inside the school grounds. The same UNRWA that covered up Hamas's theft of aid. The same UNRWA that, by the way, one of the reasons it's becoming difficult to distribute aid inside Gaza is the breakdown of law and order as a result of Israel attacking the Hamas gunmen who used to secure the convoys. Everyone took it for granted that the United Nations relied on Hamas to protect convoys of aid while it knew that Hamas was stealing aid. And that didn't strike anyone as being unusual. So here, you as an Israeli government official have to respond to the UN saying that you're not in compliance with an ICJ order based on this awful official who denies that Hamas, that, that October 7th was an anti-Semitic massacre, quoting a decision made on the basis of information from the principal organ that is used by Hamas to launder information and is 99% staffed by Palestinians and hired some of the people who are responsible for the October 7th massacre. It's not an even battlefield. But you try when you have behind you the menorah and the sign National Public Diplomacy Director to the Prime Minister's Office of the State of Israel to fight with the United Nations Special Rapporteur for da, 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 who is quoting another UN organ, which is quoting another UN organ, which is quoting with another UN organ, which maybe in the small print says, disclaimer, uh, 
these numbers come from the Ministry of Health and have not been verified. But the moment that the UN quotes them, no matter what disclaimer or small print they put at the top or at the bottom, it's good enough for the UN. And so I find myself that sometimes the best I can do is not to shape the story, it's just to get a good quote, a killer quote in the story. Because if they've got all these UN officials and all these human rights organizations and all these think tanks telling them that I'm a liar, you don't go against the people who are telling, who, who have that critical mass. It takes courage to say, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Maybe the Israelis actually have a point and let them shape the story. So, right, so, so the media are getting their, getting their information from UNRWA and from revolting specimens like Francesca Albanese and, as you said, Gil, from ordinary Palestinians who are, you know, have their own obvious agenda and, uh, you know, their things that they're saying are being treated as sort of fact without being verified or anything else. Um, I want to ask, Elon, I'll, I'll ask you, actually, um, this is, I think, maybe something some of us are wondering. You've appeared on a number of um, news channels that many of us watch, some British, some American, some others. Do you, are there particular channels or maybe particular news anchors or interviewers that you know in advance it's going to be particularly tough? They, they are particularly likely to want to uh, come across as hostile, to, to sort of start, you know, to start a fight with you, essentially. And if so, how does that, how do you prepare differently for those kinds of threats? Yeah, of course. Um, every journalist takes a different approach. Um, Piers Morgan, for example, is, is a gotcha journalist. He will try to get you to prove you do not know or to admit something. And then that's the headline. Okay, so I had this interview where the headline he got out of it was Israeli government uh, spokesman admits he doesn't know exactly how many Hamas terrorists have been killed. And I told him, Piers, your brother who fought in Afghanistan was a war hero. He couldn't give you a running bean count in the middle of a war about exactly how many terrorists he'd killed. Your grandfather who fought the Japanese in Burma was also a war hero and he had no idea how many enemy combatants that he, he'd killed. Um, as a way to try to get around and preempt that line of questioning. Um, Channel 4 is always very hostile. Um, Lewis Goodall, whose podcast, The News Agents, I enjoy very much, was one of the more difficult interviews I have. I found that both journalists, they took very different approaches. Krishnan on Channel 4 will take a certain point and then latch on, even when you think you've answered the question again and again and again, oh, that answer's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough. And Lewis would have, who I really like, had um, an approach of trying to do a ping pong. Ask you a question, doesn't let you finish the question, passes a judgment on, the, on your answer, moves on to a different question, and then when you say, but I haven't finished my question, he says, but I think you have. And then <laughs> and it's impossible to then ever, com to ever complete a point. Um, and and the, challenge, the challenge is to try to remain... Um, calm and composed because the story they want to tell is that the Israelis are violent and impetuous and cannot control themselves. And if you lose your cool in an interview, you reinforce that. If you can keep your calm and out passive aggressive them, <laughs> you send a different message about our phenomenal abilities of restraint. Very good, very good. I remember um, you mentioned Channel 4. You mentioned Channel 4, I remember... On a personal level, I like these people. I was, and, I, so I was, and, I, and I enjoy watching their shows. So I was going to ask you, I remember um, years ago when I was working at the embassy, Israeli embassy in London, and the, I think it was the deputy ambassador went on Channel 4, and he told me that afterwards, the, uh, it was Jon Snow, who in those days was the, the main... The main uh, you know woman, nothing, Jon Snow. It, it, not that Jon Snow. This is, this is a British journalist, Jon Snow. He did not appear in, um, in, uh, in Game of Thrones. Um, uh, yeah, and he said that after the cameras were off, Jon Snow just went ballistic and launched this tirade of anti-Israel invective at the deputy ambassador. So I'm interested in, where, in whether, in how, how what, once the cameras are off, 
what are your relations like with these journalists that you've been that you might be in a room with or or um oh often a very hostile interview can end with well that was great let's exchange numbers <laughs> fair enough they're doing their job i'm doing my job fair enough please one time i got interviewed to speak on fox during a war and I had come from Al Jazeera and, and RT and all, all kinds of anti-Israel media. And we were about to go on the air. And the anchor says to me, why don't you just go and beat the shit out of them there in Gaza? <laughs> and, and the interview started with me laughing and nobody knew why. Um, but since we're being very critical of journalists, we should really single out one, Anderson Cooper of CNN because at the beginning of the war, he interviewed uh, John Poland and his wife, Rachel Goldberg, mm. about Hirsch, who used to sit in back of me in synagogue. And he said to them when the interview was done, hey, can I call you in a couple minutes? Wow. And when he did, he said, I have a video that I think is of your son. Have you seen it? Mm. And they said, no. And that's how he told them about this video. Wow. And he could have done it on the air. He could have been what Elon called a gotcha journalist. It would have made for great TV, but he chose to be a mensch instead. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're the good guys as well. The good guys as well. Um, Gil, I'm going to ask you, um, you, you moved from, from journalism, from a very long distinguished career in journalism to, to some, in, in a certain way, to the other side of the, of the, of the fence. You were, you, you're now, the executive editor and executive director of an organization that's that's monitoring journalists and critiquing journalists in all kinds of ways. Are you, what what would you say? What have you what do you take with you from your previous career into your current career? Do you think it gives you a particular view on sort of how to spot journalistic malpractice or that kind of thing? A absolutely, I'm still very much a journalist and very proud of it. Um, I understand the difficulties that they're facing. Uh, I'm old enough to remember calling in a story on a payphone. Uh, I'm old enough to remember going to a press conference at 10 o'clock in the morning and having an 8 p.m. deadline and starting to write the story at 7.15 p.m. Nowadays, they, the work has gotten so much harder. Uh, they have to, if they're in a press conference, have the story online with tweets and photographs and videos by the time the press conference is over. Uh, the, there's a character in The Little Prince called the Lamplighter. He used to have the easiest job in the world. Once a day, he would turn on the lamp, and the, the other 12 hours later, he would turn it off. And then his planet started spinning faster. And so now he has to do it every minute. And now he has the worst job in the world. So I, I maintain that respect for journalists, and that uh, there are many of them doing their best under difficult circumstances. But yes, too many of them are either ignorant or malicious. And... It costs lives. That's important to know, that when they get things wrong, it, it leads to um, riding uh, on uh, the Temple Mount. Uh, we have here the spokesman of the police, Dean, in, there in the front row, has done amazing work. Um, he deserves applause. Last year, he was working so hard making sure the positive messages, Ramadan, Easter, and Passover happened all at the same time. And unfortunately, it's not a headline. Nothing is happening on in the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Temple Mount. Uh, but uh, nothing was happening, and that's great. But then something happened. Uh, there were rioters who barricaded themselves up there. And the police had to disarm them because they were going to harm the worshipers. And when they went up there, of course, they were attacked. And they had to defend themselves. And out came the cameras, and it looked terrible around the world. But the headlines said that the Israeli police went and attacked worshipers in the Temple Mount, which is the exact opposite of the truth. And because of those incorrect headlines, the D family was murdered. And rockets were fired from Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria. And an Italian tourist was murdered for the crime of looking Jewish. That is how dangerous it is. And uh, that's why you need media watchdogs to encourage there to be deterrence on that media battlefield. Very good. Um, Elon, last question for you um, before we turn to the audience. Um, and then I'll ask Gil a similar question. Israel, Israel is, like every country, is not perfect. 
And we're that not... is a lie. And you see, not... outrageous, outrageous media bias. <laughs> and um, and we're not, and because we're not a country like I don't know Russia or China, we're not the, the role. Is, the role of the government is not to present the country as perfect and pristine and never makes mistakes. My question is, what do you do in situations where things aren't clear and there's a possibility that maybe we did make a mistake? It's not, there's been, you know, I don't know, uh, something, some, there's reports of, um, of uh, innocent people being killed. We don't, nothing, it hasn't come out yet. Obviously, Hamas are claiming, as we, obviously, that Israel was a deliberate massacre, whatever, but we don't know. And it could have been, it, it might be complete nonsense, or it could have been that genuinely something terrible happened and it was a mistake by the IDF, which happens. How do you deal with that if, if, when you're faced with that in that instant and, you're, and you know that it might be a terrible mistake by Israel or it might be bullshit? <laughs> or, you know, and how do you deal with that? Because obviously, as I said, you're not, your job is not to be the, 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 the propaganda arm of some kind of totalitarian system. So what do you, how do you deal with it? We pay a price for being a democratic state with a professional civil service and not a terrorist army. Um, when Hamas put out a press release claiming that Israel had launched an airstrike on a hospital and killed exactly 500 people, the IDF spokesperson's unit could have gone, bullshit, we don't strike hospitals, and put out an immediate denial and said, well, let's chase up the information later. But they said, hang on. If we get, if we sneeze in the wrong place, our reputation is shot with journalists who are already predisposed to disbelieving anything we say and believing anything Hamas says. So we're checking it. And it took a few hours until they were able to put out a statement. My phone was exploding. A few hours until they were able to put out a statement saying, no, that's not what happened. It was a piece of Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket shrapnel. By the way, the following day, Hamas's lie was so successful, I was going on TV explaining that it was an Islamic Jihad rocket shrapnel, not realizing that the hospital was actually still standing. And, they, right, and it hit the car park, and they'd made the whole thing up. They'd managed to trick us, okay? Um, the same with the so-called flower massacre, when those poor people got crushed in a stampede. Um, and immediately they run the headline saying, Israel massacres 100 people, say health officials. Um, and again, just last week with this claim that Sky News never learns its lessons, ran a headline about Israel again launching, uh, you know, fire into a crowd of, uh, into a crowd of um, uh, people seeking aid, when it was Hamas, Hamas that did it, okay? They keep shooting, firing rockets, running over their own people, and then, and then Israel gets blamed. Um, but Israel, we have to check it. We have to check it. And sometimes horrific mistakes are made, like the killing of the three hostages. And by the way, the president today announced an extraordinary um, initiative to give certificates of recognition to the families of the three hostages, um, which is... Um, a very bold move by, by President Herzog. But we have to check these things and can't simply throw out, well, that's bullshit. Um, but there's a price because Hamas will say it immediately. It will then get amplified as, in quotes, say health officials. Um, a whole ecosystem will amplify it before Israel has half a chance to put out a statement. And then the information battlefield is weighted against it even after it puts even after it, it's put the statement out. But that's what it means to be a modern democratic country and not a terrorist army. Yeah, very good. But, but and by the way, they, but they do it quickly. They do it quickly, like the Al-Akhli hospital incident. Yeah, that was amazing. It yeah. was within a few hours. Right. And the other incident, uh, again, the accusations from uh, about shooting into a crowd of civilians, dots were on. Like, they have... People think that spokesmanning is just about going on TV and being a talking head. It's not. It's about collecting the evidence, verifying it, making sure that you're plugged into and getting a picture of what is happening on the ground. And DOTS is an empire. It's been able to do that phenomenally well under, under Hagari's leadership. Uh, my friend Karen Hadjiov as well, who is um, advising um, 
Hagari in reserves. She's an absolute, absolute queen. Um, a, a lot of work goes into making sure that the lie won't go halfway around the world before the truth can put its pants on, maybe only a quarter. Yeah, I remember, um, I remember when the, uh, the, with the hospital incident, and I, I got into a, some Twitter debate with, I think it was, uh, <laughs> anyone know um, Mehdi Hassan? Yeah? yeah. If you don't, if you don't, you don't want to. Um, and, and, he, and he was tweeting disgusting stuff about it straight away. And I, and I said, anyone remember the Janine massacre? massacre in the uh, second intifada look it up and then wait but wait for some facts to emerge before we start um, pointing fingers um gil a similar question to you in, in in this sense obviously when it comes to responding to the the media stories time is of the essence and i know on supporting is very active in in not only on social media but you have your subscriber list who you can sort of activate to get to, to get moving on these to, to get moving on these things but when you're faced with a situation where it's not clear, the facts aren't clear, um, again, you're not sure if it's just completely made up or if it was just a mistake by Israel and something terrible did happen, whatever. How do you determine, because obviously there's the, there's the need to, to be quick on the response, but you also don't want to be, don't want to make a mistake and, and, and end up sort of, de, you know, defend, claiming, claiming that something didn't happen when it maybe did. How do you deal with that? Paul, I lead a team of, of amazing investigative journalists and honest reporting who know their facts and who uh, have been doing a great job in getting down to the information and getting it out quickly. Uh, we didn't used to be that way. We, we've learned that we have to be in order to be relevant. And uh, so uh, we, we've got uh, people who uh, have been working in journalism or working in, in research in various capacities for many years and uh, they're just doing their job very well. And because of that, we've become a force to be reckoned with. And uh, so it, it's, it's a team effort. And it's been very successful. Fantastic. Fantastic. OK. Um, let's, let's go Simon to- Simon Plosker's there in the front row, the editorial director of Honest Reporting. And uh, he's been with us for uh, as long as ever. And, and he needs uh, respect. And before that, he worked with me in London 20 odd years ago, Simon. Um, OK, let's go to questions from the audience. I suspect we'll have a few. Uh, OK, we're going to, um, yeah, I'm just going to ask my colleague to come and, um, I'm not sure we've got an extra mic. Second. Milia, you can take this mic. OK, first question, this lady in the front row. Um, this shouldn't need saying, but I fear it does. Please make your questions short and a question with an upward inflection at the end and a question mark. Please. Thank you. Do you ever feel discouraged? That was beautifully short. Do you ever feel short. discouraged given that... the tremendous uphill battle? that you must be facing, that you are facing 24 seven. Okay, that's, you've set an impossibly high bar for, for, for length of a question, but thank you. Do I feel discouraged? Yes, frequently. <laughs> frequently, I tear my hair out at, at how much the world has mobilized against us and feel that I'm looking into the abyss and feel uh, deeply disturbed about the direction of public opinion. And we see this reflected in the horrific upsurge of anti-Semitism around the world. I just came back from a Hasbara tour of New York, speaking to the community there, and it's worse than I realized, and, and, even, and I thought I was following it closely. But at the same time, it's also very clear to me, as it is to the whole of Israeli society, why we fight. October 7th has given us a sense of collective purpose that we haven't had in a long time because we all understand there is no future for our country or our people in a world in which a terrorist army is able to burn people alive and get away with it, is able to abduct hostages from their beds and hold them as sex slaves and get away with it. And so we know that we fight because we must. We know we fight because we must and we know that we have to win this thing. And that, and that it's a joint effort 
of a mass mobilization of society, of everyone in the country dropping everything and devoting whatever resources and energy and expertise they have and putting arguments aside and saying only one thing matters right now, total victory, destroying Hamas and bringing back the hostages. And that sense of collective purpose that we've discovered as a society, the fact that everyone understands how important it is for us to work together to win this thing, that gives me strength and hope. Just to add to that, seeing the effort that everyone is making, each on their own, uh, at great risk personally to themselves, to their careers, uh, that's what gives me encouragement to keep on going. Uh, the team that I met at UC Berkeley, in the, one of the worst campuses that there are for a Jew in the world today, who uh, I met with them and I asked them, don't you regret not going to one of the 10,000 American colleges where you would be treated better? And they looked at each other and they said, no way. If we weren't here, who'd be leading the fight? And, uh, and they were on this high because there was a vote and they were up all night fighting to pass the higher definition of anti-Semitism. And they looked so happy and I said, wow, did you win? And they said, no, we lost 15 to four. But the Hispanic Association of Students and the Asian Student Association voted with us. And that was such a big victory for us. They lost 15 to four, but they were acting like they won. Those kinds of people uh, are the ones that give me encouragement and make me never lose hope. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, great, great answers. Um, okay, um, this gentleman here. Wait for the mic, please. Did you feel that immediately on the 7th of October after Simchat Torah, that we were already losing the battle in the propaganda wars? At 11 o'clock in the morning, on October 7th, the New York Times already uh, had a headline saying, Gaza and Israel go to war after militants launch attacks. Meaning, they didn't let us be the victims for even one morning. We were already equal. Hamas uh, attacked us, we attacked them as if going in and pillaging and raping and kidnapping uh, elderly left-wing people on a kibbutz is the same as fighting back and striking a terrorist. So yes, already on October 7th, we were fighting a losing battle and yet we continue fighting and we don't give up. No, and the reason is that my mind simply wasn't there. No, really, I wasn't in this role when this war started. When the war erupted, I was a private citizen. I spent the first 24 hours sprawled on my sofa watching the TV in shock, just a private citizen. The next 24 hours thinking that what I could do to be most useful was to help distribute food parcels to soldiers in hospitals who were already drowning under the bamba and chocolates people were throwing at them. It was on day three or four of the war that I started giving interviews from my living room as a, I took a pile of books, put them up on the living room table, took the bottle of protein powder, haven't been to the gym since the war started, it's showing, put it behind, put a lamp on top, took a picture, tweeted it and said, hello, I'm a former advisor to the president of Israel and I can give interviews about what's happening in Israel. Um, got friends together the day before I found myself in the most bizarre circumstances, getting roped into the prime minister's office, trying to set up a system where we would get um, information out by cutting and clipping testimonies of hostage families and survivors on Israeli TV, putting subtitles on them and putting them out. And 
the social media metrics in the first month of the war were insane because the world wanted to see it. They were hungry for it. I could take out an interview with girls who survived by hiding in a dumpster like it was the Holocaust at Nova, put subtitles on it, and within 24 hours, it would have 2 million views. And I didn't have that many followers on, on Twitter back then. Um, so at least when the war started, I, I was thinking about, okay, how can I contribute to the information war? And there was an incredible hunger around the world to understand what had happened on October 7th and what the atrocities were. Um, and they were so horrific and so atrocious that look, I don't like it when we say they've given us legitimacy as if this is a war that we wanted and now we have an excuse. Okay, this is the reason this war is happening because it happened and to stop it happening again. Um, but the tide turned quickly. The tide turned quickly. Okay, questions. This lady here. Yes, exactly. Hi. <clears throat> this is a question for Gil. I'm, I'm curious with respect to honest reporting, do you feel that, or do you have evidence that you're moving the needle in terms of having the larger media companies report more accurately? And is there any type of recourse other than just calling attention to the fact that they've misreported something? Is there any other recourse that is being taken or can be taken to push them to report appropriately? I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of lawsuits, et cetera, as well. Okay, so after, it, thank you for the question. Uh, after we started getting some journalists fired, for uh, being proven as, as Hitler and Hamas sympathizers, um, there were uh, there was a petition uh, among Palestinian journalists uh, of like 200 people signed it, something like that, uh, and that proved wow that they're taking this very seriously, uh, and you know that they were opening themselves up. They that they had to they had obviously scrubbed their own social media. And that proved that they were running scared. And that, that's gaining deterrence on that media battlefield. And that's important. Within a few months, there were reports on Hamas TV, Hezbollah TV, and Iranian press TV uh, about honest reporting. The, the, the report on honest reporting on, on Iran's 24-hour propaganda channel, uh, half an hour show, showed me holding my seven-year-old girl as she put the, the ballot in the ballot box. And they were doing that to show that they could get to me. They were trying to intimidate me. And, and no, we won't be intimidated. That, that's what made us want to fight even more and, and help. But yes, we realize it's hard to change journalists to get them to read their copy one more time because they know a media watchdog is watching them. And because of that, we have to be educating the consumers of news. We have to be making sure that they know what to look for. We need to be making sure that people around the world realize that there's no freedom of the press in Gaza. And because of that, they have to take everything from Gaza with a grain of salt. We have to get out the truth about who UNRWA is so they don't trust the information coming out of there, which Elon has done so well. And uh, each and every one of you can do your part uh, in that fight. You know, we have a very small staff. I, I have only three writers at Honest Reporting and uh, two people on social media. We rely on people around the world. Do not unsubscribe from the New York Times. Read it. And when there are things wrong there, send them to action at honestreporting.com. Write on social media what they're doing wrong and don't let them get away with it because we need each and every one of you who are here in the room and each and every one of you who are watching on Zoom around the world because you are all soldiers in that media battlefield and every little bit helps. And just to end with a metaphor, because Purim is coming up, you never know when you're gonna have that Esther moment where you've made a difference. Okay. You realize 
That means I'm going to make my colleague have to walk all the way around. Sorry, Milia, you're going to have to walk all the way around. I've I've been I've been persuaded that we need we need uh, geographical diversity, such as this. Um, yes, the, this the gentleman went with his hand up here. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, obviously, recognizing the importance of having the watchdog, putting out the truth, and putting out the messages. My question Can you speak is, into the mic? Sorry. My question is, as you pointed out earlier, um, we're 0.2% of the world population versus billions of people around the world. And we can put out the messages. We can reach those that need to hear, the governments, the journalists, the media channels, etc. My question is, how do we reach the, the people? Can we reach the people that not are in the choir willing to hear, but the people that need to hear, the public who needs their minds educated? First of all, don't underestimate the importance of preaching to the choir. Half of my job is preaching to the choir, but you have to preach because otherwise the choir won't sing, okay? Um, I, and I see it as being an integral part of my role to try to fire up um, the diaspora and our supporters and equip them not only with tools, but with motivation um, and help them fight back against the people who are trying to convince them that they're crazy. Um, but absolutely, when, when we are appealing to the general public, not necessarily to the interviewer, because maybe the interviewer is slanted against Israel, but the woman who's washing her dishes while she's watching her kids with the TV on in the background doesn't necessarily have an opinion. And you want us to have the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think we can appeal to the middle ground because it is so eminently clear what we are fighting for. Basic human rights. And because we also have a shot of fighting for um, elite liberal opinion. You have the woke crowd trying to drag them down an anti-Semitic rabbit hole. And I think many of them are beginning to realize, actually, these people do not represent my values. I support a liberal, free, democratic um, community and society. And these people who are interrupting our, you know, university classes by screeching genocide, genocide, um, do not represent who we are and the, the, the queers for Palestine who in some twisted quasi-theological conception of the world see themselves as part of an alliance of the oppressed and therefore take the side of a virulently homophobic, misogynistic, theocratic regime against an admittedly imperfect, I'll grant you that, uh, democratic state doesn't advance their interests either. And they see that, that they are leading them in a dangerous, to a dangerous place. And that's part of the argument that we try to uh, make. Um, and I think if it were man on man, one on one, we'd win because we're right. But that's not the information battlefield. Okay, um, the lady here in the corner. I think, Milia, I think what you're gonna to have to do is just, when you finish, just automatically go to the other side, because I'm going to. <laughs> go to the gym today. Hi, I want to thank you all for doing an amazing job. Um, and I have two questions, if I'm allowed. If they're short. Okay, one is, as a person going through all the emotions that are associated with this massacre and this war, I've gradually stopped watching news. Um, so I wonder how, I read, but I wonder how you, being in the thick of it, guard your mental health. That's one question. Good question. And the second question is, Jonathan Glazer, sickens me. So do you have to say that again? It, oh, people... Jonathan Glazer sickens me. And I feel disgusted and feel like someone needs to speak to this man because he's mentally ill. Okay, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... 
Okay, there was a statement there. Is there anyone there? Okay, is so there what any... do you think about that was the question I okay, suspect. Yes. Again. Is yes. there, are any, do any of you have a way to contact him? Okay. <laughs> okay. The, 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 fir the, first question, the first question was about how being in the thick of it. And, oh. Jonathan Glazer sickens the lady. Jonathan Glazer sickens the lady, and um, and uh, yes, and and is there a way to contact him and tell him that that he is sickened? Uh, I have a wonderful aunt, say it in British or aunt in in American, who is over eighty, and she told me that on October seventh she turned to the National Geographic Channel. And she has not, in, in Hebrew, and she has not turned the channel back to the news since then. And uh, she's very healthy because of that. And I wish her well, but we need people watching the news. You know, this is the first time you witnessed Elon and I disagreed. She said, I've stopped watching the news. And he said, good. And I said, bad. Because we need you because you are educated news consumers. You know your stuff. We need you watching it. We need you fighting that fight. We depend on all of you because of those small numbers that the gentleman said. All of you come home and join a social media platform that you're not on. Join TikTok. Because we need you there where we're such a significant minority. The only place we have a majority is LinkedIn. He, he adds NJ date. Uh, hmm. Uh, so even though it will harm your mental health, we need you. And the Jonathan Glazer is, is absolutely disgusting and his movie is very disturbing, but go watch it anyway. I'm on the Jonathan Glazer statement. I think it is, um, I think it's sad when Jews try to win acceptance in wider society by throwing the rest of the Jewish collective under a bus. From a historical perspective, it never works. As for the question of the best way to keep sane amid all the pressure, what I do to, to keep sane, um, I don't want to encourage alcoholism, so. Okay. Um, the gentleman there in the middle with the, yes, with the blue sweater. I'm calling can, everyone a gentleman. Can Mr. Levy address the elephant in the room? Must we address the elephant in the room? Do you want to specify the elephant in the room that you were referring to? Sorry? I see. Oh, that elephant. That elephant. Do you want to address it? The question was, there's an elephant in the room that has not been addressed which is news that I'm sure you all saw yesterday about our guest said on Levy, and he's about to sit for a um, It's no secret there have been disagreements. Uh, I'm waiting for some answers and clarifications. Uh, whatever happens, I'm going to continue fighting for Israel in the media. In whatever um, whatever platform I'm able to do most effectively. Uh, I'm focusing at the moment on growing the podcast platform, which we see as an integral way of being able to get our message out. We're filming two or three episodes a week. We've managed to get to 15,000 subscribers on YouTube already. It is a project that is backed by the state, not controlled by, but backed by the state. The diaspora ministry, as I said, uh, under Minister Shikli, 
have put in some very generous funding as against matching fundraising. Um, that is going to continue and we are focusing on growing that platform so that we can build a quality platform that will get information out to the whole diaspora and our supporters about what is happening here in order to arm and equip them with the tools that they need in order to be spokespeople for Israel and make the case for us in their communities on social media and everywhere else. State of a nation. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else you get your podcasts. I always say that wherever else you get your podcasts. I don't know where else people get their podcasts on those three options. But... Okay, elephant in the room addressed. Um, okay. There's a lot of, yeah, okay. Milia's going to run around the side. Um, the lady here at the, here I can see with her hand high up wearing black. You're almost, the mic is almost with you. Thank you. I wanted to ask about the other, the other elephant in the room. Oh. Um, October 7th, where was the Israeli government? Because that's the big question that the whole rest of the world's asking and um, about their response, the long time it took. And uh, that leaves like a big open question mark with a whole lot of assumptions the rest of the world's making. I'm going to put on my hat as a political analyst, temporarily. Um, Netanyahu's government came to power in December of uh, 2022, and he did not appoint a foreign language spokesman until October 7th, or October 8th, uh, Tal Heinrich. Um, he did not think it was important. With all his experience and, and all of the wonderful work he himself does as a spokesman, uh, that Elon uh, pointed out when he spoke, uh, but uh, the Israeli government was not ready when October 7th happened. There was a, a spokesman for the police uh, ready in place who's done phenomenal work. The IDF, I met with Daniel Gagari a couple months before October 7th, and I was amazed by him. I thought, finally, the IDF has someone who gets it in this very important role, who's the man closest to the chief of staff of the army. Uh, but the government itself, no. Their response, the long time that it took for the IDF to respond to October 7th massacre. Right. What? Um, so I, you know, I, I was speaking about the, the prime minister, the army uh, has an, an impressive team and they did what they could under very, very difficult circumstances, is all I'll say on that. Look, the country was caught off guard on October 7th um, for a host of reasons. One of them is that Hamas's attack was so much more audacious and psychopathic than anyone could have possibly imagined. It wasn't a scenario that we had considered because it was insane. Um, but as the Prime Minister has said, after this war, everyone is going to owe the Israeli people answers and be held accountable. And there will have to be a rigorous um, investigation of how this horrific tragedy and catastrophe befell us. And as the Prime Minister has said, those questions will have to wait till after the war because we need to be totally united as a society and focus on prosecuting the questions that will help us win that war. But undoubtedly, once this is over and the army has already begun on an operational basis to learn lessons, we as a society will have a serious lessons learned um, soul-searching process about how this happened to us. And, and that is a mark of our strength as a democratic society, that we do that. Um, it's very different from what happens on the other side. And I would recommend you to watch the episode of the podcast we launched yesterday with Dr. Shani Moore uh, discussing the seminal essay he wrote for Mosaic magazine called Ecstasy and Amnesia in Palestine about how October 7th was simply the fourth reiteration of a cycle 
of ecstasy in the Arab world leading up to a war that involved momentous violence, a crushing defeat, and then amnesia when they forgot how they brought that disaster onto themselves and the cycle repeated itself. Um, and we have to, of course, um, Zionism is about taking responsibility and learning how we take care of ourselves. And, um, and, and after the war, we'll have a lot of questions we all need to answer. Okay, um, I know there's a lot of hands up. I think we, we have time maybe for one more question. It's getting late. Um, <laughs> this is important. So much pressure, so much pressure. Um, I'm afraid we're gonna be on this side of the room. Actually, we're gonna go right in the middle to the lady in the middle with her hand up. I'm sorry, I'm so listen guys, at the end you can all storm the stage and, and, and ask questions of the speakers, but this lady in the middle here. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you, especially to Elon, who, when you finally started having your words come out in the media, it was like a breath of fresh air to finally hear somebody saying what we were all thinking. Speak into the mic. It was a breath of fresh air to hear you saying things that we were all thinking, and to finally have somebody saying those words, so thank you. Um, my question is, um, the media seems to have completely forgotten about the hostages. Um, we don't hear anything about the hostages still being in hell. And I wonder if that is intentional, if they just, or if it's just that it's not, it's not important anymore because it's not the flashing news of what's happening. So just to clarify, you mean we don't hear about the hostages in the international media? Yes, in the international media, we don't hear anything right. about the hostages. Right. They never talk about them. They never talk about right. this is what we're fighting for. This is why we, this is why we are fighting so hard. Right. Great question. We'll both answer, but you can. I think it's both. I think that, on the one hand, people understand that bringing back the hostages who are being starved and tortured and raped and executed in the Hamas terror dungeons gives Israel a reason not only to continue fighting, but why it must continue fighting. And so I can understand why journalists who their own personal preferences would want to see the war end, like many UN agencies and officials want to see the war end with Hamas on its feet, would choose not to pursue that story because they understand not how it plays into the Israeli narrative, because it reaffirms why Israel must fight. But also think about it from the perspective of the journalist. Every day your fixes in Gaza are giving you new images of rubble and of hungry people and poor little kids, uh, displaced children, you know, in puddles. And, and, and they're giving you TV material. They're giving you blockbuster material. I say this cynically. And with the hostages, we don't see or hear from them. And when Hamas does release footage of hostage videos, we don't really want them to use it out of respect for the, for the hostages and their families. So there is definitely a ton that they can do in interviewing the hostages, helping to connect the dots, tell the story, what is happening, how they were abducted, how they were abused, how they were taken into tunnels and in civilian homes. But it's not, there's no B-roll. The hostages didn't come out of the Hamas terror dungeons with footage that they can give them for TV. So it's not a story that is refreshing itself. And I think it is phenomenal what the families have done in really on an individual basis with their campaigns for their loved ones together as the hostage forum to try to find creative ways to keep this at the top of the public agenda the dog tags the um the ribbons and i hope that everyone here has either a dog tag or a ribbon and i always do when i go on on tv when i was in 
now I wear a ribbon when I was in New York, you know, I went on every interview with, with a dog tag. Um, and we have to keep the hostages front in mind. This the, the atrocities of October 7th were not limited to October 7th. It's been every day since then. We, I mean, there's no time to waste. Um, it's too late already for 35 of them, at least. Uh, and we have to keep that humanitarian crisis and ongoing crime against humanity at the top of the world's uh, priorities. And if there is one thing you can do with that TikTok account that you are all going to open today, as Gil told you, you have to do, keep crying about the plight of the hostages. We need them home. To add to what Elon said, absolutely, the families have done everything they can going around the world, uh, speaking in so many languages to make sure that their children are not forgotten. Uh, there's an organization called Media Central that works with journalists that has planted many, many stories uh, about the plight of the hostages that have been on front pages around the world, uh, and uh, that's critical. We all have to stay in October 8th mode because the world isn't. Um, we, with us, it's still raw. We all know people. We all have been connected in, in one circle or another uh, to soldiers who have been killed, to hostages who are still in Gaza. And there, if there are enough people who stay in October 8th mode, then we won't let them get away with it being forgotten. And, and so, so far, uh, regardless of what happens in Qatar with the, the deal or not a deal, there have been three hostages who have been rescued. Uh, with Purim coming up, this is the time that we pray for Venafo, for a change in fortune, uh, that there should be dozens rescued in the near future. Please, God. Okay. Um, I hijacked the that, phone. The microphone. I'm sorry? I hijacked the microphone. You hijacked the microphone. Right here. Uh, Okay. Uh, so that, oh, say, th this is I okay. Say, I've, say, I've been told you're related to one of the people on the stage, so I'm not sure I can do anything about this. Okay. Can you well, can you make it quite short? Okay. I just want to to say how impressive the two speakers were, and how much we learned from them. And to my opinion, they are very very effective in what they do. And if I may point out the guy in the middle, Gil, who is my son. I just want you to know that I taught him everything he knows. Now, I also have a question. Alone referred to people that were driven out from the north as the refugees. That's what he called them in English. There is an issue here which the state of Israel is ignoring. Because you will not hear the word refugees in Hebrew, which is plitim. You will hear evacuees. Because God forbid that in the state of Israel, which is, you know, a place where Jews are supposed to run to for, for uh, a miklat, you know, that uh, they, they will be considered to be refugees. But we should use this as another, a third element of the pressure of, to the world that we have more than 250,000 people who are refugees. Why isn't that highlighted? Of course, not as much as finishing the war, definitely not as much as the, as the hostages, but this is an important issue that has to be brought up and used, and we are not doing it, I don't think. So that's my question. First of all, you did a very fine job raising this fine, upstanding gentleman. Um, no, I, I choose my words very carefully. I said these people are essentially refugees in their own country, and that's because legally, I mean, strictly the definition of refugees, they're not. They're internally displaced people um, or evacuees because they haven't crossed into another jurisdiction. They're internally displaced. For all intents and purposes, 
they're refugees in their own country, and I'm being evocative here. Um, but you're absolutely right that we need to be talking about what is happening in the north. Uh, the fact that the kibbutzim were ethnically cleansed. I go there. I use that language. I think that's fair. Um, and we are fighting in the north because our first duty of a state is that people can sleep safely in their beds without fear of being hit by a rocket while they're in bed, by an anti-tank missile while they're on the veranda, or to be abducted and taken into Lebanon from the kitchen. Um, and that is a very definite aim. No one can tell Israel, you know what, right off the first five kilometers from the border, they're not going back. No, the response to aggression from Hamas or Hezbollah will not be that the state of Israel loses territory and has to sacrifice territory as a buffer zone. All I'll say is, is I love you. I Listen, I want to say something here. My mother watches, my mother tunes in on Zoom to all of these things. So, mum, step up to the plate and write something nice about me on the chat, please. Because... Um, <laughs> okay, we're... So, we're going to conclude there. Um, I want to thank very, very much Elon Levy and Gil Hoffman. That was... I thought that was really... I knew, this was an imp I knew this was an important event. I knew we got the right people to talk about it. I didn't know it was going to be as great as this. So I really thank you. Fantastic, fantastic um, insights, insights and information and delivery and, and everything else. Subscribe, please, to Elon's podcast, State of a Nation. Subscribe to Honours Reporting. If you're not on my mailing list for events that we do here, write, uh, write to me, paulg at begancenter.org.il. Get on the get on the uh, on the mailing list. Normally, I, I'd say we have something next week or the week after. We actually have something tomorrow. We have a webinar tomorrow um, at 9:30 Israel time, um, where, where we're going to be talking to some Israeli students who are studying in, in America on American campuses and are active on uh, in Israel advocacy on uh, some of the most difficult campuses in the U.S. So we'll be doing that tomorrow. So tune into that. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>